Right, well, I'm going to start off with the scripture. This is the text. It comes from Franz Mehring's Life of Karl Marx. And it goes like this. After Marx had become permanently domiciled in London, English literature took first place, and the tremendous figure of Shakespeare dominated the field. In fact, the whole family practiced what amounted to a Shakespearean cult. Unfortunately, Marx never at any time dealt with Shakespeare's attitude to the great questions of the day. Referring to Byron and Shelley, however, he declared that those who loved and understood these two poets must consider it fortunate that Byron died at the age of 36. For had he lived out his full span, he would undoubtedly have become a reactionary bourgeois, whilst regretting, on the other hand, that Shelley died at the age of 29. For Shelley was a thorough revolutionary and would have remained in the van of socialism all his life. Now that's the text, and of course we then challenge texts except to say that as far as it's possible to discover by checking it, Marx in the whole of his life never wrote a single word about Shelley. Professor Brewer's book, Karl Marx and World Literature, I don't know if anyone hasn't read that book here, but you're making a serious mistake if you haven't read it, wonderful book, he says that he, doubt, he doubts whether Marx ever says such a thing, simply because he does often refer to Byron, always approvingly, and never refers to Shelley. The difficulty is, though, that the fact that he did say it comes from his daughter, Eleanor. She's the source of the Francinarian quotation, and she repeats it in her little book on Shelley's socialism. I've heard my father and Engels talk again and again about this, she says about the influence of Shelley and Byron, especially on the Chartists in the, in the 1840s. So the source is the daughter. And when you are confronted with a professor of English literature, or actually German literature, at uh, uh, Oxford University, one source, and Karl Marx's daughter on the other, I think we'd probably go for the daughter, really. He probably said it. He probably said it verbally certainly never wrote it, but he probably said it, or something of the kind, that Byron would have become a reactionary boy. So let's accept that it's true, and then let's uh, test it. And uh, I, for years and years, was quite convinced that it was true. I mean, first of all, it was Marx. You know, we simply don't challenge these things. Uh, passed on to us, and that's it. I mean, he said it, and really we don't have to investigate it any further. Secondly, it also fitted a, a private fantasy of mine, which is connected with my family and my uncle Michael, which was that um, he, being a Byron, a Byronist, uh, could well be described as someone who spent his life going along with politics, which would end up with him being a reactionary bourgeois, whereas I, being a Shellian, <laughs> uh, remaining utterly true to my principles would continue throughout my life uh, remaining true to my principles and both of us would achieve exactly nothing uh, <laughs> and this, uh, uh, this little fantasy helped me to believe that perhaps there's a lot in what uh, uh, the quotation attributed to Marx says perhaps there is and I was assisted in this decision in this conclusion by the fact that I'd never read any Byron. It was a great assistance. <laughs> it was a great help to arrive at a conclusion on the basis of a quotation from Marx. If you don't have to bother go to the original sources, you can simply go on spouting it. And therefore it was a tremendous shock to me first to read my uncle's book on Byron called The Politics of Paradise, published in 1989. In my belief, the best thing he wrote. He'd written many books in his life. And then from that, to go to read Don Juan, the great, the great, by far the greatest poem uh, that Byron uh, ever, ever wrote. And, uh, well, I'm bound to say, comrades, <laughs> and I challenge anyone to counter it, no doubt numbers will, but I'm bound to say that when you read Don Juan, it's very, very difficult to arrive at the conclusion that Marx is alleged to have arrived at. It casts, in my view, even greater doubt upon the original quotations. Now the poem is, I'll have to tell you this right at the beginning, it is about 1600 verses long. They're quite long verses. These, uh, these three volumes cover the poem. 
Uh, so it's not something you can read in between now and the next meeting. <laughs> I'll buy it that side it is, it is very long. But while I've often found it difficult to persuade people to read Shelley, because many of Shelley's epic poems are really very complicated and difficult to read, there's no difficulty about encouraging people to read uh, the Don Juan, because the great thing about it is the way it flows along. It flows, it moves, it's robustious, rollicking, poetry. You can't really stop with each verse it moves on into the, into the other. And it's <coughs> constantly breaking all the rules of poetry. Purists of poetry reject it right away. It constantly breaks the rules of rhyme, it constantly fools about with rhyme. It uses all the time rude words, very rude words. There's not a sea the passenger ever pukes in. <laughs> turns up more dangerous breakers than the Euxid. That's the sort of uh, rhyme you get all the way through about him, constantly laughing at you and laughing at himself in the rhyme. He, he, he almost rejects the orders of the rhyme as part of his re revolt against society in general. He quoted um, a discussion between Ben Johnson and a man called John Sylvester, who challenged Ben Johnson to rhyme with this rhyme, I, John Sylvester, lay with your sister. Go on, Ben, your turn. Ben Johnson says, I, Ben Johnson, lay with your wife. Sylvester says, but that is not right. And Johnson says, no, but it's true. <laughs> well, I think that he quotes that. Needless to say, Byron quotes that right at the beginning uh, in order to show his utter content for anyone who comes along and tells him that there are rules, uh, are rules about rhyme. And it's written, this poem is written over a, over a, a period of uh, five years, and it's written at a time at every single canto that was written, that was sent off to the publishers in, in London was greeted not only by London society, but also by London's close, uh, by Byron's close associates, including his wife, with tremendous antagonism. The first um, uh, two cantos, when they were sent off, from every critic in London before it was published, came to the conclusion, Scroop Davis, for instance, it will be impossible to publish this. It was out of the question that anyone uh, should, uh, should publish such uh, revolutionary material. That was the, the reason for it. And Byron himself replied, he replied to the, uh, the, the publishers, he just to say, in his poem, he continued to write it. First, the first two cantos were published, first of all, in 50, in 50, just 50 copies. He agreed to that. Then he agreed that it should be published without the, without the publisher's name on it, because John Murray, the great respectable publisher of Albemarle Street, who made millions out of Byron already, refused to publish it. And so he said, he starts in the, in the third canto, he starts the third canto, which doesn't start it, but later on the third canto, here am I, I might enter on a chaste description, having withstood temptation in my youth. In other words, he's going to describe the sexual act. Now, he's about to describe it. But I hear, that several people take exception at the first two books having too much truth. Therefore, I'll make Don Juan leave the ship soon. And anyone who thinks, by the way, that it is pronounced Don Juan, you can't read the poem unless you pronounce it Don Juan because it doesn't scan. Nothing, none of the other words scans it. Because the publisher declares in truth, through needles' eyes, it's easier for the camel is to pass than those two cantos into families. In other words, there was a feeling that you can hear it today. This program is unsuitable for any children over the age of 10. Therefore, everyone turns it off. <laughs> and that was what happened with Don Jewett. The publishers had declared, it, uh, had declared that it, it was uh, unfit for publication. Nevertheless, published it was. Rather few copies were sold among the bourgeoisie, which I'll come to later. But finally, when it was finally published in 1823, just to give you a flavor, of what high society felt about Don Juan. Don't forget, we're not talking about Shelley here. We're not talking about an outcast of society. <coughs> we're talking about the hero, the darling of literary society, Byron, whose previous poems, Corsair, Child Harold, all those other poems have sold thousands and thousands of copies, making all sorts of publishers rich. This is what they have to say about this last great poem, completed in 1823. 
There is a great deal of what is objectionable in these three cantos. Who can deny it? What can be more? What can be more so than to attack the king with low, vile, personal buffooneries bottled in utter falsehood and expressed in crawling malice? What can be more exquisitely worthy of contempt than the savage imbecility of these eternal tirades against the Duke of Wellington? What more pitiable than the state of mind that can find gratification in calling such a man a sully by nicknames that one would be ashamed of applying to a coal heaver? What can be so abject as this eternal trampling upon the dust of Castle Ray? Lord Byron ought to know that all men of all parties unite in regarding all these things, but especially the first and the last, as insults to themselves and as most miserable degradations of him. Now that is a classic, uh, a classic account of the criticism that was leveled against Byron for Don Jew. And it's one of the explanations why uh, the, the, uh, the poem at, at the start sold uh, so very few. Now the poem starts with a, a wonderful tirade, which I think gives us a clue to the politics of the poem and what Byron was about. It's a tirade against apostasy, or to use a more modern phrase, selling out. The writers of the French Revolution, many of the writers, the great poets of the French Revolution, have sold the past, not only on the French Revolution, but on almost everything else, and have joined up with the establishment. And he picks out in his very first line of the poem, he dedicates the poem. This dedication, by the way, wasn't published for years and years afterwards. Nobody would publish it. But he picks out, if you like, the summit of this selling out, of this apostasy. Bob Sully, you're a poet. That's how the poem starts. Bob Sully, you're a poet. Poet laureate. Now, pause there and reflect. Suppose you were a poet. Would you start off your first line ending with the word laureate, you've got to find a rhyme for that somehow. You've got to find something that's going to rhyme with laureate. So we'll come to that. Bob Sully, you're a poet. Poet laureate and representative of all the rest. Although it is true that you have turned out a toriat. <laughs> last. A toriat. Last. And he goes on like that. Here's a Tory, Sully, who wrote the great poem to Watt Tyler to the Peasants' Rebellion in the uh, 1790s and was now the Tory Poet Laureate. And he was indicative of so many other people of the same ilk, in particular uh, William Wordsworth. And he returns to this theme, apostasy, again and again throughout the poem. Quite wonderful. It suddenly just breaks out in the middle of some narrative. He'll suddenly break into a, an attack. Uh, on the on the on the other states, the people who had broken with the revolutionary tradition, all are not moralists like Sully when he prated to the world of pantisocracy. All Wordsworth, unexcised. See, Wordsworth had been taken on by the customs and excise, paid a, a sum of money to be the poet to the bourgeoisie. Now, or in the old days, all Wordsworth, unexcised, unhired, who then seasoned his pedler poems with democracy. Such names at present cut a convict figure, the very botany bay of moral geography, their loyal treason, renegado rigor, a good manure for their more bare biography. Wordsworth's last quarter, by the way, is bigger than any since the birthday of typography, a drowsy, frowsy poem called The Excursion written in a manner, which is my version. <laughs> that was how he, how he dealt with the poem. And that's the theme. He, they have broken with the revolutionary tradition. He hasn't. He may have flirted with breaking it between 1814 and 1817, 1817, 1820, but certainly by the time he comes to write uh, 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 Don Juan, he's declared himself, if you like, a poet of opposition. A poet in the revolutionary tradition, very much like his friend uh, Shelley. Now the story of Don Juan, very, very briefly tell, a wonderful story by the way, worth reading just for the story itself. Uh, Don Juan is a rather ridiculous romantic figure who's born in Spain, and uh, he's everything is decent and chivalrous and nice, and he's brought up um, in a, a, a decent education in Spain, needless to say. There's a little passage here which is dedicated to John Patton. <laughs> the languages, especially the dead, 
the sciences, and most of all the abstruse, the arts, at least all such as could be said to be the most remote from common use, in all these he was much and deeply read, but not a page of anything that's loose, or hence continuation of the species was ever suffered, lest he should grow vicious. So he was, uh, he was properly educated there. Uh, he has a rather unfortunate affair with an older, married, respectable lady of the bourgeoisie, and is caught there in what is perhaps the first ever bedroom farce in, uh, in, in, in all our literature, and certainly worth reading uh, the accounts coming up and trying to find the young suitor uh, in the covers, in the beds. So I'm not going to give everything away as to where they find it, but anyway, <laughs> that goes on. And he's, uh, uh, he's uh, caught in the end, but sent off by his mother abroad to punish him. And he goes in a boat which is becalmed, and everyone gets hungry, so they start to eat each other. They draw lots of power to eat each other, and eventually the ship is shipwrecked, and he's shipwrecked on an island where he has a most uh, wonderful love affair, a romantic love affair, an interlude, which is quite plainly set in some political context here, an interlude where it is possible for people to live together in, in harmony. And, and the thing about the poem, I, I, the most, most things I'll say about the poem are about its tremendous sense of humor and its sense of fun and the way it uh, hopes mockery, the way it mocks the whole of society, but also it can move in pace so that from time to time it reaches uh, great pitches of tenderness. The fellow was uh, one of the greatest geniuses that ever set pen to paper. This is uh, the, the love affair that he has on the island where he's cast up there. An infant when it gazes on a light, a child the moment when it drains the breast, a devotee when soars the host in sight, an Arab with a stranger for a guest, a sailor when the prize is struck in fight, a miser filling his most hoarded chest feel rapture, but not such true joy are reaping as they who watch uh, what they love while sleeping. And there is this, this interlude, this moment where they have this love affair, because, which is bound to come to an end. You feel it's bound to come to an end. One reason why it's bound to come to an end is because uh, the woman, the young woman's father, is a slave owner who's out catching slaves, and he's bound to come back, and uh, uh, come back he does, and uh, finds them together, gets very angry because no permission has been asked for his daughter's hand, um, uh, stabs uh, Jordan with a sword so that he's badly wounded, shoves him in a ship so to sell him off for slavery, and uh, Haide, uh, his daughter, uh, that dies, uh, dies of grief. So off they go, off he goes again on his voyage. It's really just a great voyage through the post-revolutionary period uh, uh, of Europe from 1789 uh, to 1923. And uh, off he goes, and he's sold into slavery. And as a result of them being, he's, he's lucky in a way, he's a good-looking young man, so he's sold off uh, to uh, satisfy the pleasures of a a sultana, the wife of a sultan, uh, who wants young men, and because she doesn't want the sultan to know about it, she dresses the young men up in, uh, in, 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 in female clothing, so that he has to join up with all the female slaves, which he finds quite interesting anyway. <laughs> but, uh, he, and and, he, and uh, uh, the, the sultan's wife then summons him and orders him to make love to her, and he refuses. He refuses, absolutely unheard of. And she, of course, uh, is uh, beside herself with rage. Her first thought was to cut off Julian's head. Her second, to cut only his acquaintance. <laughs> there are dots before the line, acquaintance. Her third, to ask him where he had been bred. Her fourth, to rally him with, rep with repentance. Her fifth, to call her maid to go to bed. Her sixth, to stab herself. Her seventh, to sentence the lash to Baba, who's the slave. But her grand resource was to sit down again and cry, of course. So that worked, that particular ruse, and uh, he does uh, make love to her, and then he goes off with the other slaves, and she's found again making love to one of the other uh, slaves this time, and that is again a, a, a sin for which he has to pay a terrible penalty, and he has, he's about to be executed, and he escapes again and runs off, and the only thing he can do then when he runs off, is go and uh, uh, join up in a wall. That was about the only way he could get away from the Sultan's clutches 
and the Sultana's clutches was to run away and, uh, and um, uh, uh, join the British army. Clearly the British army, of course, because if, if you were going to join an army at that time, it would be better to join an army that was likely to win, uh, to win a battle, so he joined the British army, and there were then two tremendous can cantos which described the siege of a, of a Muslim town by uh, European forces. It's not absolutely clear what role the Russians are playing in this, certainly reactionally, one country or another. But there, this, in these uh, post-revolutionary times, there were numberless wars, not just the post-Napoleonic wars. But the wars didn't end at Waterloo. They went on and on and on. And these, this is a tremendous attack upon war, a tremendous assault on militarism in general. I wonder, although Mars, no doubt, is a god I praise, if a man's name in a bulletin may make up for a bullet in his body, and then the attack on Wellington, you are the best of cutthroats, do not start, the phrase is Shakespeare's and not misapplied, wars of brain-spattering, windpipe-splitting art. And I shall be delighted to learn who, save you and yours, have gained from Waterloo. So at any rate, the forces which Stuart have joined wins the battle. Because by complete luck, he happens to be the chap who's on the fortress at the end, just gets up the fortress, just as the victory is won. He is hailed as a tremendous hero. You know, it's like so many of these great heroes in the British bourgeoisie throughout history. The heroes have come that they know not where. They don't have the slightest idea um, where, where they've come from. But anyway, he's brought back, and he is then um, systematically uh, patronized by the bourgeoisie. Uh, I'm just going to... This, the, the point about the poem is that there's the narrative, which you keep wanting to get back to the narrative, but he keeps breaking up all the time with, if you like, Byron's philosophy or his political views. It breaks off into great soliloquies on all these different subjects. But I'm just going to read one or two of these. It's a, a moment of great self-indulgence for me, and I'm not going to lose the opportunity. I'm just going to read around one or two things to show you. I'm, what I'm trying to do here is to get you all to read this poem, because I, I don't want to take account on it, but I would guarantee that there are rather few people here that have read John Dewey. If we were coming out of the Marxist classic, I wouldn't dare to suggest that there weren't people here who haven't read anything. What I'm trying to do is get you to uh, uh, to, to read uh, some of these uh, this poem and to give you a flavour from some of the things that are here. Now, first of all, there's the aristocracy. He's brought across as a young man who has won single-handedly the Battle of Ishmael, or whatever it was, and he's come as a tremendous hero, so everybody loves him. Everybody, all the, all the women want to speak to him, and all the men want to patronise him. And uh, these are the sort of people he comes across in British high society. There was Dick Dubious, the better physician, who loved philosophy at a good dinner. <laughs> Angle, the soi mathematician, Sir Henry Silvercup, the great race winner. People might often wonder where the private eye get their names from. I mean, somebody on private eye once read John June. There was the Reverend Rodamond Precision, who did not hate so much the sin as sinner, and Lord Augustus Pixplack Tadonet, good in all things, but better at a bet. There was Jack Jargon, the gigantic guardsman, and General Fireface, famous in the field, a great tactician and no less a swordsman who ate last war more Yankees than he killed. <laughs> there was the waggish Welsh judge Jeffreys Parson in his grave office so completely skilled that when a culprit came for condemnation, he had his judge's joke for consolation. I think we all know about the judge's joke. They've come from time to time. Now uh, he went for Wilberforce. You know Wilberforce? He's a hero, isn't he? Don't, don't forget that he is a hero, Wilberforce. I mean, he is. And if you read Cobbett, you know about Wilberforce, who hated Wilberforce with such a passionate loathing that he actually forgot that Wilberforce did play a little bit of a role in the business of the free the States and went a little bit ultra-left. But far and not ultra-left, he gets something absolutely right. Oh, Wilberforce, thou man of black renown, whose merit none enough can sing or say. 
Thou hast struck one immense colossus down by a moral Washington of Africa. <laughs> but there's another little thing I own which you should perpetrate some summer's day. And, and, and set the other half of earth to rights. You freed the blacks. Now pray, shut up the whites. <laughs> shut up the bull coots bully Alexander. It's the emperor of Russia. Shut up the holy three to Senegal. How dare you speak that way about these very, very prominent uh, pontiffs. Teach them that source for goose is source for gander. And ask them how they like to be in thrall. Shut up each high heroic salamander who eats fire gratis since the pay is but small. Shut up, no, not the king, but the pavilion, or else it will cost us all another million. <laughs> These are the people that he, he went for there. And then, of course, there were the electioneers, the people that we meet at election times, who he... Lord Henry was a great electioneer, burrowing for burrows like a rat or rabbit. But county contests cost him rather dear because the neighbouring Scotch Earl of Gift Gabbett had English influence in the self-same sphere here. His son, the Honourable Dick Dice Rabbit, <laughs> was member for the other interests, meaning the same self-interest with a different leaning. Those were the politicians that he came across. And then, you know, since uh, I know it's fashionable to uh, to talk uh, Byron as uh, opposed to women. You know, that's a cut common thing. And of course, if you take his life, you know, there's a lot there. But there's a lot to, to go for that argument. But it's, it, if you look at the, uh, the, the actual things he writes in his poems, and also this very interesting fact that all the best writers, the best writers about uh, Byron, have had enough to be women. The most appreciative, Doris Langley Gurr, the South African writer, for instance, the wonderful books that she writes about Byron, and she understands it perhaps more than ever. But as, but as to women, he writes there in another verse, who can penetrate the real sufferings of her she condition? Man's very sympathy with her estate has much of selfishness and more suspicion. Their love, their virtue, beauty, education, but form good housekeepers to breed the nation. And uh, then back again to the capitalists, they understood who was in charge. Who was in charge? There were all these idiot aristocrats, there were these protest judges, there were the uh, electioneering politicians. But who was actually in charge? Who held the balance of the world? Who reigned a uh, Congress, whether royalist or liberal? Who roused the shirtless patriots of Spain that make old Europe's journals squeak? and gibber all. Who keep the world, both old and new, in pain or pleasure? Who make politics run glibber all? The shade of Bonaparte's noble daring? Lord Rothschild and his fellow Christian Baron. These and the truly liberal Lafitte are the true lords of Europe. And here's a little piece crept in about the ERM. Now it's rather strange to bring it just 200 years before it happened. Every load is not a merely speculative hit, but seats a nation or upsets a throne. In other words, the people with the money bags, the money bags people, they're the people who run society, and, uh, and he knew that very well. Now, I can't just with a few quotations indicate to you the richness of the poem. You can read this poem, uh, well, I read it every night, or not almost every night for you know several weeks in a row, just a verse or two, four or five verses. It does grip you and grab you, but I do <coughs> urge you to read it because it'll fill up the ideas of hatred that you have for the rulers to very, very much come over these last 200 years. It'll fill it up with all kinds of majestic language, with jokes, with abuse, which you can use endless speeches all over the land. <laughs> borrow these things, the phrases, they won't recognize them as good as no one will check it. And you can just use this, uh, these forms of abuse. So I, 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 there's just, just one other thing about it. And that, I mean, I, mean, first, I could sum it up really in this quotation from James McGann, who is one of the more recent American writers about English literature, who really understand. I'm afraid they 
for him and American writers to understand these things often very much better than the British writers do. But McGann, McGann sums up the, the, the sums, sums it up like this. For those who say, well, what was Byron's attitude to Peter Lou and so on? I mean, anybody, anybody can produce plenty of reactionary things that Byron said. The problem is you have to read the poem and find a single reactionary thing in it. But this is what McGann said. These were the years in which Byron declared himself born for opposition. Having exiled himself from England, he moved further and further into a critical relation with, with the dominant powers of Europe and their ideologies. All of his poetical work during these his most important years was directed against what he called the cant political, cant poetical, and cant moral of the English and European worlds. Don Juan is, of course, the culminant result of these efforts, a conscious effort to explain critically the meaning of the entire period in Europe stretching from 1789 to 1823. And the uh, other thing about it was that it was written in 1823. Shelley, who was Byron's great friend um, and advisor, and the relationship between the two is always skipped over by the biographers of both, because neither Shelley worshipper nor Byron worshipper really likes the interference of the other in the relationship, but neither man or their poetry can possibly be understood without understanding the relationship between them. All the time that Byron was being told by his friends, his publishers, his wife, don't publish Don Juan. You'll wreck your reputation. You've made all this money. Everybody wants to read every drawing room. Every woman wants to swoon at what you've written. Don't write this stuff because it's satirical and it's attack, it's mockery, and it's revolutionary in content. And the one person who stood by him all the way through those early years was Shelley. Kept saying, where's the next canter? Well, I promised my wife I wouldn't publish it. Oh, no, you've got the publish. Oh, no, I promised her. I absolutely promised her. He promised her after the first two, he'd never write any again. Then he promised her after five, he'd never write again. And eventually he wrote 16 and thank heavens. And it doesn't end where it ends. It ends. It doesn't end at all. It ends as typical with Byron. The whole thing ends with a joke. But it's obviously going to go on. I mean, Don Juan haunted him all this time. It was a great poem, the great work of his life. It explained everything he believed in. And he wanted to take it on. He was going to take it on through 1824. And I don't agree with Marx at all if he said that thing. I think it's a terrible pity that Byron died in 1824, just as a terrible pity that Shelley died in 1822. Because if either of them had been going at the time of the Chartists, I think they would have enriched the Chartist uh, movement, already rich with poetry and literature, would have been even further enriched by it. But uh, he didn't end the poem where he said he was going to end, he was going to go on. And the point, Shelley died in 1822, he's drowned. 1823, Don Juan is finished, the last of Byron's poetry really to speak of, and 1824, Byron dies in Greece in the War of Liberation um, against the Turks. And, um, there's another thing that the two have in common. Shelley's Queen Man, which is the most furious, angry of all his poems, which he started when he was 18 and finished in the Australian case, as many of you people here think you're too young for this kind of thing. He, uh, that Queen Man was published in 17 separate editions between 1822 when he died and 1841 in the middle of the trial. It wasn't published at all in his lifetime. No one would publish it, but the Queen Man went on and on. Don Juan was published, as I described, extremely reluctantly, very bitterly, without even putting his name on it, by Murray, and then Murray chucked it in, and John Hunt, the liberal publisher of the Examiner, had to take on the publishing of the later cantos. But that Don Juan, having been published then, uh, it, um, went on uh, as Queen Mao did. I know a friend of mine called William Sinclair, Saint nervously that he's a friend of mine because he was for years a senior civil servant of the Treasury, which he's now finally left, I'm glad to say, in great disgust. He's written a wonderful book, incidentally, about William Godwin, William Sinclair. But I went up to William Sinclair's house about six months ago, he was down in Kensington somewhere, and I went down to see him there, and he's got about, he, I, I didn't actually count them, but he has some 23 separate editions of Don Juan all published at Tuppence, Thruppence, Fourpence, very cheaply, pirated, all of them pirated, none of them properly published, I mean, very well published, but not properly published by bourgeois publishers. And all of them selling to chartists and post-chartists, 
to the people that were agitating around the 1867 Reform League, to getting the vote in 1867 and again in 1874 and again in 1884, but not just the agitations around the vote, all the strikes and activities that took place in that time. It's a long winter sleep, that period, Engels describes it, but nevertheless people were fighting in that time. And many of the people were fighting, or even those who weren't fighting, who were angrily bowing their heads in front of employers or in front of generals or whatever would sneak out at night and get a little pleasure from reading Don Jewett, going for these people. And it went, it is, according to William Sinclair, who's written a very learned thesis on the development of Don Jewett, it is the most read poet in the whole of the 19th century in Britain. No poem beats it for being read. Unfortunately, that popularity hasn't extended into the 20th century. It's something to do with the century, I think, rather than what to do with the poem. But just to end up, as you may say, I haven't proved the point. I shall now prove the point on the question of whether or not it is a revolutionary poem. I'm finishing amazingly even before my time. <laughs> uh, I, I'm the, uh, to prove the point, was it a revolutionary poem? Well, there's only one person who can answer that, really, and that's Byron. Think about Byron, and one of the things I like about him is his tremendous skepticism. He doesn't take things on trust. There's a wonderful poem that Shelley writes called Julian and Navalo, which is about his relationship with Byron and the argument that they had when they met in Venice. Political argument. You talk utopian, Byron says to him. You're a utopian. I don't go for all those wild and mad ideas that you have. And they thrash it out and they argue it through. That's Julian Mallet. The whole argument is similar. You know, in, in a way, a microcosm of the argument of reform and revolution. That was uh, when they first met in 1818 in, uh, in, in Venice. Uh, but Byron did retain, and it is retained in this poem. It's not the same as Shelley, although the ideas constantly mingle. It isn't, he's not the same as Shelley, because he retains that skepticism, which is always saying, well, I'm not so sure. I'm not really sure. I'm not sure. I know what I can see is a lot of madness and lunacy. I know that I can mock it. I'm not sure about it. And in a way, the clash between not being certain to what to do about it or how to solve the problem uh, comes out in these two stanzas which suddenly uh, arise in the middle of the poem uh, when he's talking about the Duke of Wellington and it's, it goes like this and I think, I think it really does the last line actually proves the point I won't have to say anything more after that but never mind God save the king and kings for if he don't I doubt if men will longer I think I hear a little bird who sings, the people by and by will be the stronger. The very jade will wince, whose harness rings so much into the roar as quite to wrong her, beyond the rules of posting, and the mob at last falls sick of imitating Job. I could just interpret that for a second. The very jade, the even daily journalists. I mean, the very you know, the most miserable, miserable mule that is, you know, being beaten and beaten and beaten and asking for more. Will Wince, whose harness rings so much into the law as quite to wrong her beyond the rules of posting, that you can go on bashing people and making them work harder and harder and harder. You go on thinking you conquer trade unions. You go on thinking you run. In the end, they wince. The various jade will wince. The people by and by will be the stronger. At first it grumbles, then it swears. That's what it's doing now, isn't it? Grumbling and swearing. At first it grumbles, then it swears, and then, like David, flings smooth pebbles against the giant. At last it takes the weapons, such as men snatch when despair makes human hearts less pliant. Then comes the tug of war. Twill come again. I rather doubt. And I would fain say, fire on it, if I had not perceived that revolution alone can save the earth from hell's pollution. Um, I have no way um, really 
processing that. So there's a lot written about it. Uh, all I'd say is that if you read Don Juan, if you read the poem, I mean, it's perfectly obvious that he is interested in all different kinds of sexuality, all the dressing up in different clothes, you know, all that kind of, and there's no hint that there should be any variable reach in any, in any sexual activity whatsoever. He, as far as I can see, probably was personally himself in favor of it all, probably personally experienced it all, I don't know, but certainly he had no, wasn't a whiff of any sort of uh, restriction or prejudice in his attitude to that, and that's why, of course, it's quite right that the, uh, the, the gay literature should take on that, that to those terms. Whether he was gay or not, it's quite right they should do that because those were his, his ideas. Well, that's the question of the 20th century. I mean, um, I mean it, it, it seems to be elementary. You know, that there are there are many more people reading revolutionary poetry now than there were at the time of Byron or Shelley. But I mean, uh, the name Tony Harrison. I mean, Tony Harrison. I think was an absolutely wonderful poet. Somebody mentioned the Gulf War. You know, well, Tony Tony Harrison's poem, poem on the Gulf War. I think will go on the, you know, for decades and not. Know, centuries, uh, because it, it is a most magnificent poem. It's as good an anti-war poem as ever written, ever a poem written by Byron or by Shelley. And of course the tradition comes on, of course it's got nothing to do with people being educated. The fact that people are educated, as a matter of fact, spreads these ideas, it doesn't hold, doesn't allow these ideas to develop in a greater way because people aren't educated, which I think was being suggested there. So, you know, I don't, I don't think anything we say about what went on in the French Revolutionary period and cuts off what we might say about the Russian Revolutionary period or even in non-revolutionary periods, people are going on writing the Russian Revolution, write all kinds of different writings all over the world, including in Britain. A whole host of new poets came out writing poems about how the society should change. And this is all in the tradition of Shelley and Byron. It's the same, the same tradition. And that's what, you know, saying that well, the two, two aspects of it. First of all, that it's old hatch, you know, look where we are in Marxism. I mean, uh, oh, the old fellow, you know, he's probably a long, long time he's not with us now, you know. Uh, 100, what, uh, 105 years, he's not with us. Uh, and uh, he was born, as a matter of fact, in the year that Don Juan started, Byron started writing Don Juan. So we can say 1818 was a great year for more than one reason. But uh, we don't say, oh, well, this is old hat. So what do we say? That because people are great, we have a suspicion of them. On the contrary, I mean, Philip's always saying that I'm absolutely with him. That we stand on the shoulders of the, of the giants. We at least stand on the shoulders of the giants so that we can see what's happening. Uh, we, 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 the fact that Lenin had a you know, marginal grasp of revolutionary politics assists us now. I mean, they say, oh, we're not going to quote Lenin or Marx or say what wonderful people they were and how much they did because they were great men. That would be ridiculous. And, would turn, in a way, the whole tradition on its head. So you re recognize people's greatness, that people, individual people, can be great, greater than others in any particular respect. What we don't recognize is their right, because of any such greatness, to get any more out of the society than anyone else, to exploit people that have bang them on the head or anything of that kind. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, that's what we're against. We're against the exploitation, the uh, uh, inequalities, the lack of egalitarianism. Not that we think of people the same, or that we go to concerts purposely to listen to bad cellists when we know there are good cellists <laughs> <laughs> All of that notion seems to me absolutely grotesque, quite nonsensical, and nothing to do with a, a socialist society. Um, uh, 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 some very good things were said. Clough, uh, um, it was good to hear Clough mentioned. Uh, I first heard of Clough from uh, Tom Pauling, you know, who is. Uh, <laughs> Professor or lecturer at the Reader of English, Nottingham University, and uh, is responsible for enlivening a whole great host of, uh, of revolutionary literature, not just Byron and Shelley and Milton, by the way, which he's pretty good at reviving, but also right up to the present day, including Cup, who not, was a Chartist, actually. Cup was, was writing in the Chartist period. And he wrote in, the, in Latin hexameters, which those of us who were brought up in the classic tradition didn't think was possible in English. The only person, the other person who did it was Longfellow, the American poet. You know, but uh, the club examiners are absolutely wonderful. So, I mean, there's somebody coming up with a name that I've only heard about the first time last year, and it's marvelous to hear that, that, that said. On the question of the romantics, I mean, um, I, I really resent the use of the expression romantics. I know we're really forced to use it, Captain Gallery used it, but forced to use it because it's imposed on us by the 
divisions of our educators and they say, well, are you studying the Romantics? Usually the answer is no, by the way. Prelude, it is true what you said about the Prelude being, uh, you know, without humor. I think you would have a job to say it was a bad poem. You know, you really would have a job to say that the Prelude was a bad poem. It's an argument that it's probably the best poem ever written in the English language. But, uh, you know, it doesn't have the, it doesn't have the, the humor or the life force, but it does, I mean, it does look back, doesn't it, to, to the revolutionary period and, and wonder why and really reflect in this rather serious and melancholy way the words of had. Nevertheless, I mean, Fellows' grasp of language and control of ideas, his ability to relate his ideas to the language is quite is quite exceptional. So I think we need to be a little bit careful about who we put down. I draw the line of Larkin. <laughs> I, I think we do need to be a little bit careful about this because it isn't, you know, we're not just using a, um, a political a, a political measure. I mean, somewhere I think Marx says that all good literature is revolutionary, even if it's counter-revolutionary. I mean, you know what I mean? If it's good, I mean, if it's really good, if it's grass, it's got wonderful, it doesn't suck, any, any, that, that in a way, the exact opposite of people who've called themselves Marxists in, the, in, the, um, in, in, in latter-day years, who think that what, to be a Marxist, what you mean is that you, the only thing that's any good agrees with Marx, well, actually, when Marx writes about literature, he's exactly the opposite. You know, the, the literature itself, the better it is, the better writing, the more people can grab people by writing, the more revolutionary it becomes, even if it's saying things which are counter-revolutionary will seem to be running right against the revolutionary stream. So those are, those are um, um, uh, just some of the ideas. I, I, I hate the word the romantic used for these people because they were not romantic, they were revolutionaries. Somebody spoke about what we're talking about. We're talking about Someone said they're waiting for rebellion to come. I thought that person who spoke had really crossed what was happening here, which is that there had actually been a rebellion. You know, there had been the French Revolution, the greatest re 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 rebellion, or whatever you want to call it, the greatest social upheaval in the history of the world up to that time, around from 1789. The whole of that Don Juan poem is dedicated to people who were originally called by that idea and who lost it. I mean, we have it in a less, a less uh, uh, obvious way now because we after the, the 68 74 period which was revolutionary in a whole number of ways you can see during the whole of the 80s people turning off that writers poets all sorts of enthusiasts turning off and the interesting thing for us is to see how not just the people turned off because that would be an entirely depressing message but that there were people who stuck by the revolutionary tradition that's the reason why it is so exciting reading this stuff because it's magnificent it's wonderful language, it's tremendously powerful. The ideas are summarized in language, that's really the point about poetry. Not that I think somebody said that it was abbreviated, that that was the great advantage, that it abbreviated things. I'm not absolutely sure about that, so I think, you know, maybe it does. The real thing for me is that the words linger in the memory when they're put to rhyme and rhythm, so that they stick in your memory. The words, the words representing ideas stick easier in your memory. That seems to be the real advantage poetry, which has a real political part or political message, can stick around in your head for a long time. A poem of uh, Tony Harrison's about the Gulf War stuck around in my head about the, you know, you have this, this cock crowing in the middle of the night because of the fires that were burning in Kuwait. And that notion of that cock crowing, all the miserable things that were happening about it. I mean, some, a, a notion, an idea that sticks in your head because it's written in poetry. The words linger uh, in your mind. So, you know, I, I think, I, I, I think, I think, you know, somebody said, you know, something about picket lines. I mean, none of us ever joined this organization or became socialists because we wanted to go and sit on a picket line or because we wanted to go and sell a paper outside of a factory on a winter morning. Not one single person could join for that reason. Oh, I would like to go and stand on a picket line. You guys have that. I, I stand on a picket I want to stand on a picket line now, but I'm, I'm going to become a socialist because you, you want to change the world, you want a new world, a whole new world, a world organized on different principles, different people in charge, with the thing democratically controlled, the economy planned, the people producing the things that they want. That's why we join, because we want a new world. And that's why these poets are part of our tradition. 